Welcome back to the Stronger by Science podcast. My name is Eric Trexler. I am the special temporary primary host of this podcast. And today I'm joined by Greg Knuckles. He is currently the permanent guest co-host for the time being. Greg, thanks for joining me. How are you doing today? Thanks for having me on, and I am doing splendidly. How are you? I'm doing great. Um, Let's dive right into it. Uh, The first thing I want to mention here um, with the podcast is that uh, I'm the first person to admit to your mistakes, and you've done a very poor job so far uh, highlighting the Research Spotlight newsletter. (laughs) That's, uh, you know, when I bring you on as a guest, uh, you know, temporary full-time co-host, I need you to pull your weight and not kind of be there like dead weight. Uh, I know you've been jockeying for a more formal position, but uh, neglecting your duties is not a good way to secure that. So I'm going to pick up the slack. Uh, A lot of people are not yet subscribed. I'm going to interpret those comments as fat phobic. And uh, when when we get done recording, uh, we'll we'll see what HR has to say about that. Oh, and the union. That's going to be tough. And the union, yeah. 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 Um, So... The Research Spotlight newsletter, Greg, some people aren't subscribed yet, which is crazy. Uh, What you get is a two-minute breakdown of one study every Wednesday. So Greg and I, uh, you know, pick a study, break it down, gets into your email inbox uh, every single Wednesday. And the Research Spotlight newsletter is the easiest way to stay up to date with the latest exercise and nutrition research. The best part, Greg, it's totally free. Completely. If there's one thing I learned in grad school, it's that passing up on free stuff is literally the same thing as losing money. Yes. Okay. So as a grad student, I remember I would walk past uh, a free cup of coffee and I would know that that is the same thing as losing somewhere between two and five dollars. If you don't take that free cup of coffee, Uh, passing on a free lunch, it's literally like getting punched in the face and having someone take 10 or 15 dollars straight out of your pocket. Uh. Imagine you're offered a free banana. What could a banana cost? $10? Well, when, if you turn it down, it's like losing $10 right out of your wallet. Okay, so if you want to protect your net worth and you want to demonstrate your fiscal responsibility, check out the newsletter. You can do that at strongerbyscience.com slash newsletter. Uh, of course, there are other ways to support the show as well. You can light rate like rate or subscribe wherever you happen to get the podcast. You can go to strongerbyscience.com slash coaching to check out our one-on-one virtual coaching program. You can uh, use our discount code at bulksupplements.com. The code is SBSPOD. That gets you a 5% discount. Of course, you could subscribe to the Mass Research Review, which is a huge research review. There's written articles, shorter research briefs, uh, video lectures, audio roundtables. That goes out the first of every single month. And of course, you could check out Macro Factor. That's our diet app, which does offer a free trial. So you can try it out uh, before you make any kind of financial commitment. Uh, Another piece of news. There is a new article on the website, Greg. There is. Uh, It is by Cameron Gill. He's written Mm -hmm. a few very, very good articles for our website. Uh, Always a pleasure to be able to host one of his articles. Mm -hmm. This one is called Neck Strength Training. Are deadlifts and shrugs enough? Uh, And here's just a little teaser for the article. If you wish to increase neck strength for a particular sport or neck muscle size for an aesthetic goal... There's no substitute for direct neck training. This article discusses why and how to effectively implement direct neck training, even if you don't have a ton of fancy equipment to facilitate that process. Yes, and also I will add, since we're talking about neck training, even just this mention, I'm sure that some people will say in the comments below the YouTube video or across social media when we share the podcast episode, hey, but with neck training, if my neck gets bigger, Is that going to give me sleep apnea? I'm not saying that any of of the individuals listening to this are responsible for this, but when we shared it on Instagram, there were probably, it felt like three dozen comments that were just like, oh, but I don't want to get sleep apnea. That's directly addressed in the article. So if that's a concern, uh, before before belly aching about it, read the article, uh, see if it assuages your fears. Uh, The the. TLDR version of that, though, is that in all likelihood, the primary contributor to sleep apnea is tongue size. 
specifically if you have a large fat due, or a large neck due to adipose tissue accumulation um you also have fat deposits in your tongue and if you store fat around your neck you probably also store fat in the base of your tongue that's probably the main thing contributing to sleep apnea uh similar with uh, and, and this wasn't directly addressed in the article Th this is just kind of me freehanding here um, but with people who develop sleep apnea after they start using steroids, um, the muscles around their neck blow up, uh, shoulder girdle muscles tend to have a pretty high density of androgen receptors. Um, in all likelihood, that's probably just due to muscle hypertrophy of the tongue as well, rather than neck muscles per se. Um, it, it's hard to see like a clear mechanistic reason that the muscles of the neck would be able to put much pressure on the airway passages, whereas simply having a bigger tongue would, uh, and tongue size tends to correlate with neck size, rather than neck muscle itself per se being a major factor. Um, but anyway, that that is addressed in detail in the article with plenty of references if you would like to check it out. And otherwise, neck training, it's good and cool, and uh, having a big neck is awesome. Absolutely. Uh, now, one last thing we need to address before we get into the segments today. I want to talk a little bit about Fat Bear Week. And to kick things off, I'm going to start by uh, playing a couple clips from, from one of our episodes about a year ago when we were talking about the results from 2021 Fat Bear Week. Bear Week is over and Bear Week is also canceled. Um, I have canceled it. We have canceled it. The winner, uh, as they're calling it, was 480 Otis. A lot of, I guess I would say, irregularities. That's, yeah, that's fucked. Yeah, so. Oh my God. Needless to say, we're upset. The, the fix was in. I shouldn't have to spell out how patently unfair that is. This Fat Bear Week uh, has left a very a very sour taste in my mouth. And I don't know that I can ever trust democracy again. So those are some pretty, um, pretty poignant quotes. Mm -hmm. And at the time, people said that we were just haters. Some people called us conspiracy theorists. But I would say more like canary in the coal mine would, yeah. would be more appropriate. So, Greg, I'll, I'll turn it over to you um, to give a little Fat Bear Week update. Yeah, I think we're just in a weird place in our culture where the people who respect election integrity and... If there are abnormalities, they, they maybe want recounts or, or to look into it closer. Those people are, are tarred and feathered as conspiracy theorists, and that's, that's really a shame. Uh, we, have, we have plenty of, uh, of, of packet captures and whatnot that will be presented as, at a cyber symposium about all of, all of the fraud that took place in Fat Bear Week voting. Uh, but yeah, this year there was a... I think semifinal matchup between 747, spoiler alert, the eventual champion, uh, and was it 480 Holly? Yeah, I think I it was Holly, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think people were stuffing the ballots for Holly, and uh, that was called. Whole graveyards in Cook County were turning out to vote for Holly. Uh, <laughs> there, there were ballots being shipped over from North Korea, I, I believe. Um, just, just all sorts. You know, if they if they required valid forms of voter ID to vote for Fat Bear Week, who knows what would happen? Um, anyway, uh, so yeah, that that actually got caught uh, and investigated, and uh, it was it was overturned. Seven forty seven advanced and then went on to win the finals. So congratulations to uh, seven forty seven for for winning Fat Bear Week this year. Um, I think I saw someone refer to him as Bear Force One, which is a good pun uh, on on his number uh, sharing uh, with with the with the Boeing model planes. Uh, but yeah, so so congrats to uh, to seven forty seven for a well deserved uh, twenty twenty two Fat Bear Week win. So a quick update: I actually think, just in the interest of being, when we have our symposium, obviously we'll go our our ducks in a row here. But I believe I think th I think they found bamboo in some of the ballots from Arizona. Wow. Um, maybe maybe fake ballots from China. You never know. Well, uh, it looks like the some of the uh, 
fraudulent votes were for Bear 435. So I, I don't want to mm. disparage uh, the fans of Holly or Otis or any of the other uh, upstanding bears who, who, of course, would have nothing to do with this kind of scandal. Uh, but yeah, I believe it was uh, Bear 435. And, you know, 435 has a reputation, as I don't have to explain to, yeah, as, to the audience. Yeah, as we all know. Yeah. So anyway, uh, really sad to see that. Um, and hopefully they can clean up their act. And, uh, you know, we kind of caught on to it about a year before everyone else. But hopefully ne by next year, they can kind of improve the integrity of their operations. Uh, all right, Greg, let's get into some fitness stuff. Uh, what do you got for us this week? <clears throat> yeah, let's do it. So uh, my segment is on increasing explosiveness and training to maximize jump height in particular, but probably most sort of explosive movements in general. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the one weird trick that I'm going to talk about is training with accommodating resistance or uh, for, for people who haven't spent much time with the west side barbell parlance, just training with bands or chains. So um, just just for some very, very basic background for people who have not trained with bands or chains before, aren't very familiar with accommodating resistance. Uh, basically, it's just a, a different way to add resistance to a variety of exercises, but pri primarily what I'm thinking about here is barbell exercises beyond just putting more plates on the bar. Uh, and so when you add plates on the bar, you know, the barbell is 45 pounds, you slap some 45s on, now it's 135 pounds, and uh, that's just due to gravity, which is pulling straight down all the time. And whatever, you, whatever lift you do, uh, at all points in the range of motion, there will be 135 pounds of resistance you have to overcome. That's, that's just what the weight is. With accommodating resistance, uh, if you hang some like thick elastic rubber bands over the bar, uh, those bands behave as a Hooke's Law spring would, or in other words, as they're stretched, the resistance they provide increases linearly. So uh, at the bottom of a squat, for example, the bands might provide 40 pounds of resistance, and at the top they may provide 80 pounds of resistance, and right in the middle guess what? They'd provide 60 pounds of resistance. So it allows for variable resistance throughout the range of motion, uh, and chains behave similarly. You can uh, hang chains from the bar, generally off of a smaller chain, so that uh, when you're at the bottom of a lift, most of the chains are on the ground, and then at the top of the lift, most of the chains are off of the ground. So, for example, if you put 100 pounds of chains on the bar at, say, the bottom of a bench press, Maybe you're feeling 250 pounds with all of the chains on the ground. And, and then when you lock it out, you're now feeling 350 pounds because those 100 pounds of chains have come off of the ground. Um, so yeah, with, with accommodating resistance, you can vary the amount of resistance you're dealing with throughout the range of motion. And in particular, it makes the lifts a little bit easier at the bottom, a little bit harder at the top. Uh, Eric, have you ever done much or any training with bands or chains? Oh, hell yeah. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. I mean, what, what's your, what's your go-to or, or what's your favorite? It kind of, it didn't really matter, dude. Uh, so when I first got into, um, coaching, mm -hmm. um, like, like, you know, working as a strength coach, uh, I was working with a, a wrestling team and a football team and I had all the gym access I could ever want. Mm -hmm. it, and it was a really well-equipped gym. I would go in there, I was, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old, and just put chains on literally everything because yeah. it was so badass. Oh, I mean, absolutely. Dips, pull ups, just throwing, like, could have easily used any other mode of resistance. But I was like, no, dude, put the chain around my neck. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I would do, um, you know, uh, rack chins or kind of like, you know, inverted body weight rows with some chains. I would do uh, bench press with chains. I would just, any excuse to get them in the mix, I would use it. Yeah, that's that's completely valid. So I I also love chains. I personally don't like bands all that much. Um, not because I think they're ineffective. I just I just don't like how they make lifts feel. But that, and, and they're to me they're always a pain in the ass to set up. I I agree. It's it's hard to find two bands that have like the exact same amount of resistance, so the bar feels like a little bit uneven. Um, but anyway, yeah, love chains. Anything with chains. They're one. They're loud, and I yes. like I like things that are loud. Uh, you're lifting like you're working out makes you sound like Jacob Marley, which is very cool. 
uh, one of one of the best characters in in all of fiction and literature. Um, and yeah, like I I really enjoy the way they make most most strength curves feel. Um, but yeah, so that's that's what we're going to be talking about here for for the purpose not so much of trying to maximize strength gains, but trying to maximize gains in explosive performance. And like I said, specifically jump height. So uh, I I actually got in trouble uh, a couple months ago uh, when talking about accommodating resistance. Uh, I was on Dave Tate's Table Talk podcast, and this topic came up. Um, and I mentioned that, like, hey, the, the research tends to suggest that for specifically maximizing gains in raw strength, like, say, trying to maximize gains in barbell squat one rep max or barbell bench press one rep max, uh, training with accommodating resistance does seem to be effective for strength gains, but doesn't seem to be more effective than just training with straight weight, um, which in most uh, sectors of the powerlifting community is is a pretty uncontroversial opinion. Um but there are a lot of like big time old school West Side fans in in the table talk audience. Uh, they didn't particularly like that perspective, um, which is totally fair. Uh, but I will note that the that the research and also just like the training practices of the current best raw powerlifters on the planet agree with me. So on the on the powerlifters side, I mean there are a ton of extremely strong raw powerlifters out there. Uh, and if you stalk them on social media to see how they train, you, you just don't see that many folks training with bands or chains a ton anymore. Again, specifically for, for raw powerlifting, uh, accommodating resistance for specifically strength development does make a lot of sense for equip lifting because it allows you to experience a strength curve that or like a resistance curve that is a little more similar to what you'd be dealing with with equipped powerlifting, because like a bench shirt, squat suit, helps you more at the bottom of a lift than the top of a lift. Uh, so if you don't want to have to deal with getting into all of your gear, but you still want a similar uh, training experience, you can set up accommodating resistance to kind of mimic that. But for raw lifting, um, yeah, I mean, you, you just don't see that many top raw lifters doing a ton of training with bands or chains these days. And on the research side of things, uh, in 2015, there was a meta-analysis published by Soria Gila and colleagues uh, suggesting that training with accommodating resistance did, in fact, uh, improve strength gains to a larger extent than training with straight weight. But then in 2018, another uh, group of researchers led by Dos Santos um, like I, I think these, I think these folks were just planning on doing a study, uh, like looking at the effects of of bands or chains on strength development. So they're they're like, okay, let's kind of get our feet wet in this research. Let's pull up this meta analysis, see what it found, and then they started looking through the meta analysis and said, I think they may have accidentally miscalculated some of these effect sizes. So they wrote in and said, hey, I think there were some errors here. Uh, and and to the credit of Soria, Gila, and colleagues, um, they looked back and said, "Yep, you got us. Like we we made a mistake." Uh, so that that has now been updated, and the the pooled effect is like, yeah, straight weight is effective, bands and chains are effective, uh, training with accommodating resistance doesn't seem to be more effective than just training with straight weight, though it does still work. Um, Do you think that might be the only exercise science meta with an error? <laughs> uh don't want to get too far off topic but we we should probably talk about that that paper we will at some point but I, for for people that are listening we won't get into it but there there was a paper i think last week or the week before that was published indicating they're like yeah we went through a bunch of metas and like exercise and sports science and i think they said 85 percent had a statistical error it, at least one yeah 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 uh which is both not that was very unsurprising to us. Yeah. Um, but I think it would be surprising to a lot of people. But yeah, it's cer certainly not what you'd like to see. Right. Yeah. But anyway, um, sorry, sorry to interrupt with that tangent. But but yeah, so uh, training with accommodating resistance in terms of one rep max raw strength development doesn't seem to be all that beneficial. Again, it, it's good 
it works fine. It just doesn't seem to work better than training with straight weight. Uh, and there's good good reason to kind of suspect that it wouldn't be better than straight weight. Uh, and, and the reason for that is just for most exercises, if you're doing a one rep max, uh, specifically barbell lifts, generally you're not your your strength, your one rep max, isn't going to be limited by how strong you are through the entire range of motion. It's limited by how strong you are through the very weakest point in the range of motion, which is usually pretty early on in the concentric phase or near the bottom of most lifts. Um, and in fact, it's it's even earlier on than I think a lot of people realize. Most people assume the weakest point in, say, a squat or a bench press is when the bar is moving the slowest, but it's actually not. It's when the bar is decelerating because force is mass times acceleration. And so if acceleration is negative, that means there's less force output. So if you're like, if the bar is still like moving at the same relatively slow velocity, that means the force you're exerting is uh, either equal to or greater than the load on the barbell. If the bar is actively decelerating, that means at that moment in time, you're exerting less force than the force being exerted by the barbell. Uh, so yeah, like the, the weakest point in the lift is even before like what is commonly defined as the sticking point. So it's it's low down there. And that's that's where you're weakest in most lifts. And so that's what's determining performance. And the way that uh, the way that bands and chains work, it's like I mentioned before, a band stretches as you go up, more chains come off the ground as you go up, so it makes the lift harder near the top of the lift, which is totally fine, but like generally that's not the part of the range of motion that's going to dictate what your one rep max is. It's more about can you create enough force there at the bottom of the lift where you're the weakest. Um, and so like, yeah, I mean, there there's every reason to think that training with bands and chains are probably better for building strength through the top part of the lift than training with straight weight would be, but that's not going to influence one rep max strength all that much. And training with both straight weight and accommodating resistance should be equally efficacious for increasing strength at the bottom of the lift, like as long as you get the loading, right? So the, those results I think are, are pretty intuitive. Um, so yeah, that's that's not all that surprising. But with explosive performance, the calculus is a little bit different, and and this is where we're getting into like the actual thrust of this segment. So with explosive performance, it's it's a completely different ball game because it's not about how strong you are through the very weakest point in the lift. For something like jumping, it's about how much force can you put through the ground for the entire duration of the time your feet are on the ground. And so if you're getting a lot of velocity going, your feet aren't going to be on the ground very long. Um, you know, you drop down, boop, pop right back up pretty quick. And so for that short period of time, for the entire duration of the time your feet are on the ground, you need to be putting as much force through the floor as possible to accelerate your center of mass. And as soon as your feet hit leave the ground, uh, the velocity your center of mass has at that point of takeoff will directly determine how high you're going to jump. Because um, you you are no longer putting more force into the floor, therefore an upward force on yourself. As soon as your feet leave the ground, gravity takes over, and your takeoff velocity, just like one-to-one -one determines how high you're going to jump. And so you need to accelerate as much as possible during that entire time of during that entire time span you have available to you. And therefore, strength and power output through that entire range of motion is now very, very important. Like, if you can exert a lot of force in deep knee and hip flexion, that's cool. But if you can also exert a lot of force with very little knee and hip flexion right before takeoff, that is equally beneficial. So, Essentially, if, if there are two people who have who weigh the exact same amount, uh, they have like similar fiber types, like you, you equate everything between these two individuals, and they squat the same amount through a full range of motion, but one of them squats way more for like a half squat or quarter squat than the other one does, you should expect that individual with the higher half squat and quarter squat and same full squat to jump higher than the other person, because they have similar force output through that weak part of the range of motion, but through the stronger part of the range of motion, that second individual 
is stronger, can exert more force, uh, etc. And so, uh, as I mentioned before, a benefit of, ch of training with accommodating resistance is you can better match the resistance curve of an exercise with your natural strength curve. So, you know, for example, if you can bench press 225 pounds or like 100 kilos, that basically means that you can exert about, eh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to use kilos as a force measurement. I realize they're not, but you get the point. That means you can exert about 100 kilos of force where you're the weakest. But at the top, maybe you can exert 120 kilos of force. If you're just training with a barbell, you're stuck with 100 kilos. You can't go heavier than that. You'd fail the lift. Uh, with bands or chains, on the other hand, you could potentially set it up to where, you know, maybe you have 90 kilos on the bar and 20 kilos in bands and chains or something like that. It's 90 kilos at the bottom. It's a little bit easier, but then it's 110 kilos at the top. So it's it's matching that it's matching the resistance curve of the, of the lift to your natural strength curve a little bit better. So even though that's not going to be extra beneficial for improving your one rep max, that probably will be extra beneficial for increasing strength throughout that entire range of motion. Uh, and, and if you're watching on YouTube, um, there, there's a figure that we can flash up on the screen now that, that kind of illustrates how this works, how with accommodating resistance, you can make sure that that the lifts you're doing are uh, challenging through a larger relative proportion of the entire range of motion you're training through. And so for that purpose, just kind of on an a priori basis, you should expect that training with accommodating resistance should be better for improving explosive performance. Uh, and in fact, that is what we see when we look at, at the literature. And I'll also note, it's it's a little surprising how little research there is on this topic, um, just because a lot of times practical application guides research to some extent. Like there, there's a bit of a give and take, like research guides practical application and practical application guides research. If there are a lot of coaches doing something specific in the gym with their athletes, uh, some of those athletes are going to become master students in exercise science and realize like, hey, the stuff that my coaches were doing, uh, I don't think there's research on that. I'm going to do that as a master's project. So there, there's kind of that feedback loop. Um, and bands and chains are just, you know, it, from a quote unquote in the trenches perspective, are used pretty frequently for, for training athletes at all levels of sport from uh, like you're not going to see them in many high school weight rooms, but like training facilities that specialize in training high school athletes like off the clock or out of school will we'll often use bands and chains. Uh, plenty of college weight rooms use bands and chains for a lot of stuff, like you mentioned before. Um, so yeah, th this is a pretty common thing in practice, but I was only able to find four particular studies um, that have examined uh, this. So comparing training with straight weight versus training with bands or chains, and, and all of these studies use bands. Um, on uh, gains in explosive performance, and, and particularly jump height here. So uh, to start with, a uh, study by Shi and colleagues, uh, SHI, and a as a note, mention this every time, all of the studies I cite will be linked in the show notes. Uh, so starting with a study by Shi and colleagues, um, the subjects in this study were collegiate basketball players who uh, were, were pretty well trained to start with as far as collegiate basketball players go. Uh, average one rep max squat was like 125 kilos, which for tall fuckers, like that's not bad. Um, and they, they completed an eight week training program. One group just trained with straight weights. The other group trained with a combination of, of straight weights and bands. Uh, and the the resistance provided by the bands in the band group was equal to 35% of 1RM at the top of the lift and very, very little at the bottom of the lift. Um, so the amount of load on the bar that was replaced was equal to about 17% of 1RM to uh, equalize average loading between the two groups. So just to illustrate, if a subject had a 200 kilo squat, uh, and, and I'm just using that to, to make the numbers easy. Um, so let's say a subject had a 200 kilo squat, and in a particular workout, they're going to be training with 80% of 1RM. 
So that's 160 kilos. So in the group that was just training with straight weight, you would just do reps with 160 kilos. In the band group in this particular study, uh, what they would first do is remove, um, uh, they would add an amount of bands that was equal to 35% of 1RM, which in this case would be 70 kilos, so 200 times 0.35, about 70. Uh, And then they would um, replace uh, a a portion of that. So in in effect, um, like, you would want it to be an average of 160 kilos throughout the entire uh, uh, portion of the lift. So it would be, um, I I think they would put 125, yeah. So it would be 125 kilos on the bar plus the 70 kilos of bands. So it would be like 125 at the bottom, 195 at the top, average out to 160. So that, like, I did a poor job explaining that, but that, that's what they did. Hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. Um, so yeah, they, they train like that for eight weeks, uh, and ultimately squatting with bands and squatting with straight weight, uh, as one would expect from the rest of the literature, uh, led to similar increases in one RM squat strength, which again is what, what we should expect. Um, but squatting with the bands did lead to larger increases in squat jump improvement and counter movement jump improvement. So uh, it was like 21.4% versus 12.9% for squat jump and 129 versus 5.6 for counter movement jump. Ooh, but the p-value was 0.056, so that doesn't really, I mean, it's not below 0.05, makes you think. Uh, well, okay, let's just go with squat jump then, which was a p of 0.008. <laughs> I'm being a smart yeah, ass. I Obviously, mean, it, I, I don't subscribe to that nitpicking uh, with, with regards to p-values. Yeah. Uh, yeah, twelve point nine percent is uh, bigger than five point six percent. I, I, I agree with that assessment. Um, okay, so so that was uh, the first study. There were two more that had broadly similar results. So one was by Katushabe and Kramer, and the other was by Joy and colleagues. In the study by Katushabe and Kramer, uh, the subjects were male soccer players. They trained for six weeks. Um, Again, one group with bands, one group with straight weights. They found that squatting with bands led to at least nominally larger uh, increases in jump height than training with straight weights, so about 2.67 centimeters versus about 1.38. And then in the study by Joy and colleagues, uh, the subjects were, again, collegiate basketball players uh, completing a five-week training program, one group squatting with a combination of bands and straight weights, the other group uh, just squatting with straight weight. Um, and they looked at two measures of a vertical jump performance. They measured vertical jump height on both a force plate. So like using an equation to estimate, um, like how much, like how high people jumped from their ground reaction forces during the actual jumping movement. Uh, and then also just a more direct assessment of jump height using a vertex. Uh, and, if memory serves in the study, the vertex uh, jump height improvement, there was a nominal difference between groups. So it was like a 6.3% increase in the band group versus like a 4.1% increase in the straight weight group. I don't think that was a statistically significant difference. And then for the the force plate assessment, uh, it was like plus 7.5% in the band group and like minus 1.8% uh, in the straight weight group. And if memory serves, that was a statistically significant difference. But like I said, all, like all, all of the, the nominal differences lean, lean in favor of, of squatting with bands in all of these studies. Uh, however, the fourth study uh, by Anderson and colleagues in this little body of literature uh, did come to different results. So uh, the subjects in that study were trained women. They completed 10 weeks of training Again, one group squatting with bands, uh, or a combination of bands and straight weights, and the other group uh, just squatting with straight weight. And uh, they assessed counter-movement jump height um, with, uh, like, like basically different knee angles to start with. So, like, how far you would descend uh, for the counter-movement before jumping back up. So, they looked at kind of, like, a, a... two kind of normal uh, 
ranges of motion for jumps, so through 60 and 90 degrees of knee flexion. That's around how much most people would flex their knees before a jump. And then they also looked at, like, what if you just did a really, really deep counter movement before you jumped, um, so down to about 120 degrees of knee flexion. And what they found is that, at least in terms of nominal differences, gains in jump height at 60 degrees of knee flexion were pretty similar uh, between the two training approaches, uh, leaned slightly in favor of squatting with bands, but then at 90 degrees and 120 degrees, those nominal differences leaned in favor of squatting with straight weight. So essentially, we have three studies that tend to find benefits in favor of training with accommodating resistance, and we have one study that found... Uh, at least at deeper levels of knee flexion, some some benefits maybe of squatting with straight weight. So uh, what could potentially explain the, the different results between these three studies? And I think the biggest difference is just how much of the total resistance came from bands. So in the three studies that tended to find benefits of squatting with bands, uh, the ones by Shi, Joy, and Katashabe and Kramer, uh, the bands replaced about 15 to 20 percent of the total load on the bar uh, with the total band resistance equaling about 30 to 40 percent of 1RM at the top. Um, and for the Anderson study, the, the total band tension used and therefore the amount of actual weight replaced by bands was like twice that large. So it was uh, a, a relatively enormous amount of band tension used in that study. So like, that, that kind of makes sense intuitively, right? So, in the Anderson study, they found that through deeper levels of knee flexion, squatting with a ton of band tension maybe wasn't great for improving jump height. But if you have a ton of band tension on the bar, effectively, you're just making the very bottom of the lift very easy. So, what you should be going for, and I think what three of the four studies in this area accomplished, is with accommodating resistance... Instead of a kind of traditional strength curve or resistance curve you'd, you'd see with straight weight where the bottom of the lift is hard and the top is easy, what you want to do with the amount of accommodating resistance you use is you basically want the entire lift to be similarly challenging throughout. You want the bottom to be challenging. You want the top to be challenging. Train that entire range of motion. I think what happened in the Anderson study is they used so much band tension they inverted that typical resistance curve, where instead of now being hard at the bottom and easy at the top, I think they just made it very easy at the bottom and hard at the top, uh, so there was less transference to jump height at, at deeper degrees of knee flexion. Um, so yeah, uh, overall, the, this uh, body of literature, and also just kind of the, the logical reasoning I, I laid out at the start of this segment, all suggest that training with bands should and does uh, improve jump height and explosive performance, likely to a greater extent than just training with straight weight would, um, which makes sense. You match the strength and resistance curves better. You build more strength through a longer total percentage of the range of motion you're training through, uh, and that should help you exert force through the floor through a larger total range of motion before your feet leave the ground. So you're not just strong at the bottom, you're strong through that entire range of motion, uh, and, and that should be beneficial for explosive performance. Um, like I said, all of this stuff uses bands uh, rather than chains, and it's all mostly just looking at jump performance. So I assume that these are probably generalizable findings. Like, I assume that uh, if you subbed out bands for chains, it would still be beneficial because you're still matching strength curves in the same way. Like what, what they accomplished with bands in these studies, you can also accomplish with chains. Uh, I don't see a reason why benching with bands or doing deadlifts with bands wouldn't, or chains, wouldn't have similar effects through those uh, ranges of motion and, and general movement patterns. Like, um, you know, if you're trying to build explosive hip hinging strength like deadlifting with accommodating resistance should be pretty good we just don't have research on it um but yeah so i assume these findings generalize i just don't know for sure uh, another note is that the gains in explosiveness in these studies were were pretty specific so 
I, I made specific note of talking about the gains in vertical jump performance uh, and, and the various sorts of jump tests you do mimic the mechanics of squatting pretty well. But uh, several of these studies also looked at gains in sprint performance or gains in agility test performance. Uh, and for those measures, uh, training with bands didn't seem to be more beneficial than training with straight weight. Once again, like with one rep max strength, it wasn't that it was less beneficial than training with straight weight. It still worked. Um, there just wasn't like an additive additional benefit. So, you know, like it, it seems like maybe training with bands will help you jump higher, but might not actually like improve sprint performance or change of direction performance uh, to a greater extent than training with straight weight, which Again, to be very clear, means it's still good. It's just not better. Uh, and then f finally, uh, for for loading recommendations, I, I think that um, I think that the the three studies where training with bands worked are probably a pretty good starting point. So in in all three of those studies, uh, the amount of band tension used was equal to about thirty to forty percent of one RM, uh, replacing an amount of straight weight resistance equal to about 15 to 20% of 1RM. So that, that seems to be a pretty good starting point. So for example, like if your one rep max squat is 100 kilos uh, and a workout would typically involve squatting with 80 kilos for sets of five, you could instead do 60 kilos with 40, or yeah, 60 kilos with 40 kilos of band tension or 65 kilos with 30 kilos of band tension. So the average resistance throughout the range of motion would, would average out to the 80 kilos you, you'd be uh, otherwise training with, but that should help match your the, the resistance curve of the exercise with your strength curve a little bit better by, again, subbing out about 30 to 40% one rep max uh, amount of resistance with, with bands or chains. Um, and then also, j just as kind of a final party note, is intent matters. Uh, intent matters a lot with with any power training, whether you're whether you're using accommodating resistance or just training with straight weight. Um, you want to really be trying to aggressively accelerate the bar as much as possible through as much of the range of motion as possible. Which I'll also note is just another benefit of training with accommodating resistance. Like if if you're doing explosive bench press with just the bar. At lockout, the bar has to come to a stop. Like, if you have any reasonable amount of load on the bar, you don't want the bar to leave your hands. That's dangerous. Like, that's that's bad. And so a, a decent percentage at the end of the concentric is going to be spent just decelerating the bar. Like, you're not actively trying to push through lockout. Um because if you did, the bar would either leave your hands or there would just be like so much inertia in the bar. It would like pull your back up off of the bench. That's happened to me. Fucks up the rest of the set. Not good. You don't want that going on. Similar with squats. Like if you really try to accelerate all the way through the concentric with straight weight, um, as you would if you were jumping, guess what's going to happen? You're going to jump. And like jump squats exist. But if you're, you know, if your heels leave the ground or the bar comes up off your shoulders a little bit with like 70% of 1RM, especially if you're not ready for it, that could be a little bit hazardous. One of, the, one of the benefits of bands and chains is just since the weight's getting heavier and heavier as you proceed through the concentric, you can just actively accelerate through a larger portion of the concentric before you have to decelerate there at lockout. Uh, so that's good. And... And also, I mean, especially with bands, I don't know exactly why it feels different than chains, but like it does. Like when bands hit you, they hit you hard. Uh, and like on squat, they try to slingshot you through the floor. Um, so I think like I think like a low key benefit of of power training with bands is just like they sort of force you to be really really aggressive with every rep because. If you don't if you don't generate velocity out of the hole, like when when they hit you, you're gonna feel it. Um, but yeah, for for any power training, whether you're training with bands or chains or just straight weight, uh, intent matters. Like you you really want to try to accelerate the bar as aggressively as possible through as much of the range of motion as possible. But uh, 
like I mentioned, bands and chains do help you facilitate doing that just just based on how they they change the resistance curve. Yeah, this is not directly related uh, to vertical jump and, you know, power and things like that. But I will say uh, COVID related gym shutdowns completely changed my relationship with bands. Uh, Mm -hmm. For the longest time, I was like, oh, those (laughs) those things are kind of a pain in the ass to set up and Mm -hmm. and all this stuff. And, And and then COVID hit and. Man, without bands, I don't know how I would have gotten through that as a person who lifts and as a as a coach. Yeah. Like, who man. Uh bands really came through when I needed them and I will forever be appreciative. So yeah, chains and bands are always gonna be on the good side for me. Chains because they're very cool and badass, and bands because when you're in a pinch, especially if you're training at home, uh they, they really do expand what you can do. Oh, for sure. One one other thing I'll note, not related to improving explosiveness, gem performance, whatever, but just just kind of like a, a low key benefit, especially of training with chains, um, and especially for folks who've been lifting for kind of a long time and are like maybe sort of beat up. Uh, so, like I mentioned with the Anderson study for strength development, for power development. You don't want to like fully invert that resistance curve where now instead of being hard at the bottom, easy at the top, it becomes easy at the bottom, hard at the top like that. That's probably not the best way to set them up purely for improving performance. But uh, if you maybe have achy hips or achy shoulders uh, and you get some like range of motion related discomfort on like bench press where you know, if if you're if you have pretty heavy weight on the bar, your shoulders just your shoulders or elbows just really don't like you much, specifically at the bottom of of the press. Uh, but you also don't want to just take seventy percent of the weight off the bar and just train light all the time. Like that's not fun. You don't want to do it. Uh, something you can do, which like I've done, and, and I know a lot of older lifters do this, um, is you can just put a shitload of chains on the bar so now like the bench is easy at the bottom where where maybe your shoulders aren't quite as happy with you but it just like gets hard and heavy as you press it so you can still feel heavy weight in your hands you can still like really exert yourself not have to do like 40 reps per set with a super low load but still um you know give give some of those soft tissues that aren't super happy with you a little bit of a break from the from the really heavy loading um that that's another just like very nice thing you can you can unlock with accommodating resistance yeah for sure all right you ready to move on yeah let's do it awesome so i've got a segment today uh, about energy compensation exercise energy compensation so this is a topic that we are revisiting. We've covered it before, uh, but a couple things have changed. First of all, now we have graphical capabilities. I can actually insert images on the YouTube presentation that'll make these things, uh, these concepts a little bit more tangible. Uh, and now we also have a brand new tool on the Macro Factor uh, website that makes this information a little bit more accessible, but more importantly, a little bit more actionable you know you can actually put this stuff to use now so i figured it was a good time to revisit the concept and first of all someone might be asking what is exercise energy compensation and i think that's actually best answered by looking at a a bit of a problem in the research mm-hmm. uh something that's come up time and time again and to address this problem in the research i want to lean on an article, a mass article that the good Dr. El- Eric Helms wrote for mass. And it's been, you know, we've talked about it before. I don't like the guy, but I still appreciate his work, you know, uh, and I try to stay impartial in that regard. I, so. I, I was going to ask if, if we'd squash the beef, but uh, definitely not. Sounds like we haven't. And that that's the way I like it. If anything, it's getting, it's intensifying. Good. You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, don't like the guy, but he's done some good things. I have to give him that. So His article was called... Why do you flee the country and run halfway around the world to New Zealand? Like It it makes you wonder what he's trying to get away from. It does make you wonder. It makes makes me wonder a lot. And I got people looking into it. It should make more people wonder. Yeah. Just just throwing that out there. 
Yeah. And where was he when all this fat bear week voting was going on? I don't know. <sighs> Inquiring minds want to know. Yeah. So anyway, his article was called why cardio isn't as effective for fat loss as you'd expect. And that pretty much lays out the problem. People have looked at a bunch of different uh, controlled interventions using cardio as a fat loss tool. Uh, and results have been, uh, I think it's safe to say, pretty underwhelming. Uh, so in this particular article, he was reviewing a paper by Broski and colleagues, which was called Effective Aerobic Exercise-Induced Weight Loss on the components of daily energy expenditure. That's a great name. Broski? Broski. It, it is yeah. a good name. Uh, now, in this study, uh, they had 42 participants. They were individuals with obesity, and they were put into three groups. So one was basically a control group. One was an aerobic exercise group that was doing a lower amount of total weekly exercise. So they were trying to burn eight kilocalories per kilogram of body weight per week. So they were kind of tailoring the exercise dose accordingly. And then there was also this higher expenditure group who was shooting for 20 kilocalories per kilogram of weight per week. Um, so they were, they were doing this intervention. And they were also looking at a whole bunch of metrics pertaining to energy expenditure. So uh, the cliff notes, I'll, I'll put up a table that shows some of the more detailed uh, results of the intervention. But the cliff notes is the high expenditure group, uh, they did lose a, signi a statistically significant amount of body weight, but it was only half the amount that would be expected mathematically. If you basically crunch the numbers and said, how many calories were they supposed to burn off with this exercise dose? It basically only delivered about half of the mathematically anticipated weight loss. Uh, they also found that their total daily energy expenditure increased by about 4% driven by, by the increase in exercise. Um, but when they brought them into a metabolic chamber and directly measured their energy expenditure for 24 hours, of course, in at, that at rest, right at rest. Yeah. yeah. So I was going to say, of course, in that chamber, they weren't exercising. Yeah. Uh, when, when they took it from free living conditions and said, okay, with, without the added influence of that exercise, what's your kind of just basal resting energy expenditure like? resting not basal over this 24 hour period and it actually decreased by four percent it, it appeared that there was a kind of a uh, compensatory change in other non-exercise elements of energy expenditure uh now the lower dose group that was doing less exercise uh their uh body weight was not reduced to a statistically significant uh degree so uh basically what they concluded there was that uh aerobic exercise at this higher dose uh, was able to produce weight loss, uh, but it was less weight loss than expected, which appeared to be related to some kind of compensatory reduction in non-exercise elements of energy expenditure. Um, so that brings me to uh, a model that really is at the center of the conversation about exercise energy compensation. So Herman Ponser, is a researcher down the road at Duke, uh, and, and he has really popularized this idea uh, of the constrained total energy expenditure model. And I'm going to put up a figure that kind of demonstrates what this model proposes. Uh, but, but a lot of Ponser's early work was looking at total daily energy expenditure in different societies with very different physical activity levels. And one of the things he noticed was, you know, you know, I mentioned in the previous study by Broski, they kind of did a mathematical assumption of how much weight ought to be lost. And going into that model is the, or going into those calculations is the assumption of the additive model, which mm -hmm. if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see it on the left side of the screen. But the idea with the additive model is very simple. It's basically, if you add some exercise to your routine and you add maybe 200 calories per day of exercise, then your total energy expenditure will go up by 200 calories. If you add 300 calories of exercise, total energy expenditure will go up by 300 calories, right? Mm -hmm. It's a very, very straightforward thing. Now, the constrained model, which you'll see on the right side of your screen if you're watching on YouTube, this paints a different picture. Now, what this indicates is that as you increase more and more exercise or other types of physical activity, total daily energy expenditure will go up but at a certain point, you start to get some diminishing returns. It looks like there's some kind of ceiling effect, some kind of constraint 
on energy expenditure when physical activity levels get really, really high. And one of the things that is playing into that apparent ceiling effect is uh, it it appears to be some adaptive changes in non-exercise components of energy expenditure. So as the model dictates, as you go, as you start ramping physical activity up and up and up and up and get to really high levels, there will be compensatory reductions in other, you know, more resting components of energy expenditure that, that basically... Th- those adaptive changes a- appear to just offset the tremendous energy cost of this added activity. And, mm-hmm. and it, you could kind of take it back to evolutionary uh, mechanisms and theories about why it might be disadvantageous for us to just kind of scale up energy expenditure more and more and more as we have high activity levels. Yeah. You could imagine in a in an environment in which food is scarce and you might have increased activity for uh foraging, gathering, hunting, whatever the case may be, it might be uh, helpful in some cases for there to be some constraint on how much your energy expenditure ramps up. Yeah. Now, And and, and also, to be clear, for the people who are, are listening to this, can't see the model uh, on, on screen, it's also like proposed to be a pretty dose-dependent thing, right? Absolutely. Where, that, that's a good point. Yeah. Like, if you're currently incredibly sedentary, don't exercise at all. And start, you know, just going for a daily walk and burning 100 calories through exercise. That might lead to a 100 calorie increase in your total daily energy expenditure. But if you're already very active, exercising a lot, burning 1,000 calories per day through exercise, and you add 10% more exercise to where now you're burning 1,100 calories per day through exercise, like you're going from, from high to even higher. That 100 calorie increase in exercise, since you're already quite active, will lead to an increase in total daily energy expenditure, likely considerably smaller than 100 calories. Yeah. So, like it, the constraint model be- behaves very similarly t- to the additive model. If you're going from sedentary to lightly active to like moderately active, maybe. But if you're going from like moderately active to very active, or like very active to extremely active then some more of those adaptive mechanisms uh, uh, set in to where you have reductions in or larger reductions in in other components of total energy expenditure. Correct. Yeah. And that's a good point. And there's really two main misconceptions that are that that have picked up a lot of steam and uh, a lot of people uh, kind of reinforce these misconceptions unintentionally. And so they've kind of been popularized. But uh, the, the first misconception is the one that you just mentioned, which is that you know, a lot of people just completely ignore the fact that this is a dose dependent, nonlinear uh, thing that's happening. Right. So like you said, as you go f- higher and higher into really high levels of physical activity, the compensatory reductions in other components of energy expenditure get increasingly larger and larger. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so that's the one thing. The other misconception, which is probably the more impactful one is people seem to indicate that the level of uh, compensation here, you know, the amount of energy that's being offset by these adaptive reductions in other non-exercise components, people seem to reinforce the idea that the compensation level is 100%. Mm-hmm. Like I've heard a lot of people who have said, you cannot increase your total daily energy expenditure through exercise. Yeah. Because if you increase, you know, 100 calories of exercise, you're just going to decrease 100 calories of other stuff. Yeah. It is very important to to note that that is absolutely not what this model indicates if you look at how it's depicted by the person who created it. And more importantly, it's not what the data underlying the model indicate (laughs) exactly yeah yeah the the much more important element is that people keep spreading this idea as if we can't just look at actual papers that have measured this stuff yeah and the compensation level is simply not a hundred percent uh it is is well below a hundred percent but that brings us to kind of the the main question here in this segment which is well what is the magnitude of compensation? And just to to be super clear, when I talk about the magnitude of compensation, I'm talking about, you know, 
to what what percentage of this increase in exercise energy expenditure is being offset by compensatory reductions in other components of total daily energy expenditure. So the magnitude of compensation, if you're asking what is it, well, it's not 100%, mm-hmm. but uh, unfortunately, it turns out to be quite variable from person to person and from context to context. So I wish that I could say, hey, it's not 100%, it's 30 But I, I can't really say that uh, uh, because it, it's extremely context dependent and it does vary a lot uh, among individuals. So there are a few key characteristics that we can look at when we're trying to figure out, okay, well, for me or maybe for my client that I'm coaching, what is a reasonable expectation for the magnitude of compensation? And, and, and just to just to make make all of this very explicit, because I think sometimes people get confused when you're throwing out percentages. It's like, ah, percentage of what? So just to be like very, very explicit, to say that 30% compensation occurs implies that if you burn 100 calories from exercise, 30% of those calories won't kind of contribute to increases in total daily energy expenditure. So 30% compensation means if exercise increases by 100 calories, total daily energy expenditure increases by 70 calories. Correct. So like... A higher compensation number means a smaller increase in total daily energy expenditure as exercise increases. A smaller compensation number means a larger increase in total daily energy expenditure as exercise increases. Exactly. So yeah, for that 100 calories worth of exercise example, uh, if you're doing that 100 calories of extra exercise and it's a 10% compensation value... Your you know total daily energy expenditure goes up by ninety calories. If it's a fifty percent compensation value, then total daily energy expenditure only goes up by fifty calories. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that that a, a lot of people ha- have kind of speculated about is does this vary based on biological sex? You know, does it seem to differ a lot when we compare males to females? And there is a paper by Caro and colleagues. Um, it's the best evidence available to date. To actually explore that question and the answer appears to be no it it doesn't seem like there's kind of a systematic bias by which compensation levels differ when we compare males to females uh, for this particular outcome Uh, as we've mentioned previously you know people have asked does it differ depending on your total activity level absolutely Uh, so if you are someone who like you said earlier has a very low baseline activity level and you're just adding a little bit of exercise, you can anticipate a low compensation value, which means you're getting the most bang for your buck if you're increasing physical activity and hoping to increase total daily energy expenditure. Uh, If you're someone who is extremely active already, uh, then you can expect a much larger compensation factor, which again means that the exercise that you're adding is having a, a more constrained or restricted impact on total daily energy expenditure. Mm -hmm. So activity level absolutely plays a big role. Another thing that plays a big role apparently seems to be energy balance. Um, So I'm going to put an image on the screen here. This is from a paper by Willis and colleagues, but they were interested in looking at uh, using a big sample uh, of participants with really high quality measurements. They, they had doubly, doubly labeled water data accessible for this particular study. They were looking at uh, essentially the degree of compensation and how that varies uh, for people who are in negative, neutral, or positive energy balance. So, you know, neutral energy balance means you're just eating at maintenance, basically staying pretty weight stable. Negative energy balance means you're in a caloric deficit. And so over time, you could expect to be losing weight and positive energy balance means you're in an energy surplus, which means over a longer time scale, you could expect to gain weight. Now, for people who are in neutral or positive energy balance, the additive model did just fine. So again, the additive model basically assumes minimal compensation. Technically, it assumes zero compensation. So what, what, what that tells us is people in neutral and positive energy balance the compensation value is quite low such that the additive model did just fine uh, in terms of, of kind of, uh, you know, predicting how total energy expenditure would change or, or what kind of compensation level we would anticipate. 
Uh, however, looking specifically at people in negative energy balance, so people who were in an energy deficit, uh, the constrained model did a better job explaining the data when compared to the additive model. So what that tells us is for someone who's in negative energy balance, we can expect that it will uh, essentially increase the degree to which they compensate for an increase in exercise energy expenditure. So smaller compensation values for people in neutral or positive energy balance larger compensation values for people in negative energy balance. Um, one final consideration or characteristic that comes up a lot in this research is BMI. Now, there was a, the study I mentioned previously by Caro and colleagues, uh, excellent study and a really, really nice data set that they're working with. Uh, it, it, it's the uh, doubly labeled water database. Um, I forget the acronym of who houses it. It's like the International Atomic Energy Agency or something like that. I, I believe um, that's correct. Yeah. yeah uh, but anyway, huge database. There have been a lot of great papers coming out of it lately. A really impressive collaborative multi-center effort, which is what we need in the research world. So I, the reason I keep uh, kind of like gushing about it is because it, it really is a, a, a tremendous utility for the research world. Um, but anyway, uh, this paper by Caro and colleagues, they identified that compensation levels did seem to vary based on BMI. And what they found was when they looked at people at the 10th percentile of BMI, so people with low BMI values, the compensation uh, value that they calculated was around 29, 30%, give or take. When they looked at the 90th percentile of BMI, so higher BMI values, uh, the compensation value was all the way up around 46%. Uh, so it was a meaningful BMI-related uh, difference in terms of the compensation value, but the question about BMI is really challenging. Um, I'm not quite certain what to do with it, practically speaking, mm -hmm. uh, because when we look at an observational relationship like this, where BMI seems to be predictive of compensation values, there are a few things that could be going on. So, so for example, um, a, a question you might ask is, you know, is high exercise energy compensation a hereditary characteristic that predisposes someone to developing a higher BMI, or does the development of a higher BMI somehow increase exercise energy compensation? It's kind of a chicken and egg scenario, and an observational study like this doesn't really give us an opportunity to answer that with, with a high degree of confidence. Um, one possibility, you know, someone might also ask, is it possible that energy compensation estimates might be to some extent distorted by the fact that BMI fails to distinguish between fat mass and fat free mass, uh, which, which obviously fat free mass is far more predictive of resting energy expenditure. Uh, that is possible. Some of these studies try to, to go in and account for that uh, statistically, but it is something that muddies the water a little bit when we when we try to make um, when we try to take that BMI information and kind of extrapolate to body fat percentage or something like that. Um, another question that I think is 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 a really important question is: Is it possible that people with higher BMIs in these studies are simply more likely to be intentionally restricting energy intake? such that the observed effect of BMI is actually more related to the current state of energy balance. Yeah. Uh, to me, that is a, a really important potential confounder that, you know, when we look at these huge sets of data, is it possible that people with higher BMIs are more likely to be doing physical activity for the purpose of weight reduction? Or, or they, they might be simultaneously trying to establish an energy deficit. So it's very possible that the BMI effect could be really just showing us what was previously discussed in that Willis paper, which yeah. is that higher compensation values are observed in negative energy balance. Yeah, it's like the classic finding that uh, the people who consume more diet sodas tend to have higher BMIs, but it's it's like, yeah, the, the diet sodas aren't causing that. Like they're go they're going out of their way to drink diet soda because they're trying to lose weight. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so I presented some questions here that are worth consideration that I simply don't have the answers to. 
Um, but, but the ones I presented so far are, are kind of uh, specific. Here's a vague one that is still applicable, it's still a very valid question, which is, could there simply be other behavioral characteristics that just distinguish individuals with low BMIs from individuals with higher BMIs, such that the observed effect of BMI is driven by something else entirely? Um, with this type of observational approach so far, uh, like I said, it's the best data that we currently have, but there are inherently limitations to the types of conclusions we can draw. So when it comes to the BMI effect, I'm simply not that certain about what to do with it. It's something that I'm monitoring really closely whenever a new study comes out. Um, I got my hopes up this past month. There was a study that came out that looked like maybe it would it would provide some additional insight, but unfortunately, um, it just didn't get at the question the way I was hoping it would. And so for now, uh, the BMI relationship exists. It's something that's out there. Um, but in terms of practical application, it's it's one that we simply don't know what to do with. Uh, but what we can say with, with a decent amount of certainty so far, based on the evidence, is that the degree of compensation doesn't appear to be dictated by biological sex, definitely seems to depend on activity level, and does seem to be related to current the, the individual's current state of energy balance. I, I can I can tell you what my hunch is for the BMI thing as someone who does uh, certainly have plenty of experience with uh, with both being fat and just being very different sizes throughout my life. Um, I mean, I, I think that that first thing you, th you threw out uh, is high exercise energy compensation a hereditary characteristic or does the development of obesity somehow increase compensation? I suspect it's probably both. Um, like that that's like I certainly have uh, uh, hereditary factors working against me. Um, and even when, even when like I, I am or have been smaller, like uh, a thing that people tell me is like, oh man, like I can go for a jog in the morning and like, I feel great. That just energizes me for the rest of the day. And whenever someone says that to me, I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> um, you know, I'm not denying their experience. But I, I can tell you good and well, I have never had that experience in my life. Uh, if I do any exercise whatsoever, even if I'm already in good shape, it, it doesn't have an energizing effect. Like, I just I just want to chill the rest of the day um, or, or at least chill more than I otherwise would have. But then also the impact of that is also influenced by how large I am at the time. Like w when I am smaller. Uh, Exercise just doesn't take it out of me as much the same way. Um, so yeah, like I, I think that there that that is always just kind of like a factor in the background based on just some hereditary characteristics I'm dealing with. Um, but I also think that that for for me personally, like my exercise energy compensation is a lot higher when when I'm heavier than when I'm not. Yeah, that, that's an interesting observation and. There, you know, we follow the research more closely than the typical person um, because every month we're going through the journal sweep with hundreds of studies and just keeping an eye on what people are doing. I would say that this particular question is on my very short list of, of research questions that I'm eagerly trying to chase down. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really hope that people will get at this from creative ways, you know, like take really creative approaches. I, I think one thing that comes to mind is like, it would be interesting to expand upon your anecdote with even just some qualitative research, uh, getting groups of people with, with very different body sizes and weight histories and just saying, what is your experience with exercise? You know, like, I mean, how does it impact your energy level the rest of that day, that week? How does it impact uh, appetite responses? Like, I do think that that's a really valuable, uh, it's it's an, a valuable opportunity where qualitative research could really help dictate how to get at it in the future experimentally. Yeah. Um, and I, I'd like to just broadly see more qualitative research in our field. I, I think, um, I, I know that uh, James Steele's group ha has done a, a few qualitative studies recently, um, and 
I, that that's a trend that I very much like. Mm-hmm. I, I hope that people will will carry that forward. It, it, Israel Halperin and his and his collaborators they they do some qualitative work too, right? Yeah, yeah. It's it, it's I, a lot of people um, when they see a qualitative study, it, they kind of have a double take if they're not used to that whole world of research. But but it it can really help fill in gaps and and guide a lot of uh, hypothesis generation for sure. Yeah. And, and I mean, if we just ignore qualitative research, there there is a just large breadth of human experience that is difficult to quantify in like newtons or inches or kilograms or whatever. Um, that, yeah, like if, if we don't have quality, like if, if we don't have qualitative research or just like ignore the qualitative research, we're essentially closing ourselves off from like a pretty large proportion of the total questions that could be asked and tentatively answered by research. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, so moving on, we've talked about all this exercise energy compensation stuff. It seems interesting, um, but it's kind of hard to put that into action. You know, um, you, you have to do a, a lot of calculations and kind of make a lot of estimates about what this value should be and that value should be. So that is why we developed a tool to help with this. So uh, I'll link it in the show notes. If you go to macrofactorapp.com slash exercise calorie calculator with a hyphen between uh, all those those three words there, it'll take you to a calculator that estimates the net impact of a specific exercise bout on your total daily energy expenditure. So it will be customized to your body size, the modality of exercise, the duration of and the intensity of exercise. And we will also uh, basically do a, a prediction of your compensation value based on the characteristics that we gather in this tool. So we ask you kind of a short series of questions, use that information to determine things like your most likely resting energy expenditure, your most likely compensation value. Um, you know, we, we get the characteristics of the exercise bout. And for the exercise bout, uh, what, what, what we do is we, we pull met values from the 2011 Compendium of Physical Activity by Ainsworth and colleagues. Um, so th- that full compendium uh, has like over 800 types of exercise. So I think if, if people check out this tool, they're going to be very surprised to see the variety of exercise modalities and intensities uh, that are represented within this tool. So you, previously, um, I, I had made a little spreadsheet available. I didn't really talk about it much, but I made a little spreadsheet and it was like, well, you have to go find the met value of your exercise and you have to go tell me what you think your compensation value is and, th- and stuff like that. It just wasn't very user friendly, which is why I didn't talk about it much. It was like, hey, this exists, but there's a lot of footwork that, that you have to do yourself. Yeah. Um, in, in this instance, you just click the link, answer some really basic questions about yourself and uh, and it helps you out. So obviously b- people are going to be critical and say, oh, you're just trying to you know push this thing. It's totally free. Uh, <laughs> You couldn't possibly make us any richer by using this. So this isn't like a big advertisement. This is just an area of research I've been following closely. And we're pretty stoked to be able to put together a tool that that we think is pretty helpful here. Um, Yeah, because I mean, like this is I mean, this concept isn't totally novel. Like there there are like exercise calculators out there that you can find. Um, But they, they I haven't seen another one that gives any sort of guidance about what amount of compensation you should expect so they they kind of they seem to tacitly operate on the additive model or just kind of like hope that you know what to do with it like if you uh like go on a run and it says like oh yeah you probably burn like 350 calories on that run and it's like well what should you do with it like how much should that impact your dietary targets how much is that likely to impact your total daily energy expenditure Ah, who knows? Like you could look through the research for yourself and like try to make some estimates. Um, but th- this calculator is novel in the sense that like it it does all of that legwork for you based on based on the research that we have and what we do currently know about energy compensation. Um, instead of just kind of spitting out how many calories it expects you have burned in the training session itself or the exercise session itself it estimates what that likely net impact is on your total daily energy expenditure and 
The thing I love about it the most is it actually gives like a probable range for where those those comp for like where those compensation values might fall. We need ranges on a lot more things in this world, folks. Uh, especially if you're if you're predicting something or estimating something. Um, like I, I understand why people do this, and I, I'm not I'm not faulting anyone for it. Like it's it's a lot easier for any sort of just like web app or whatever to just like do some math and spit out a single number that looks like a very precise point estimate. Um, and it's a lot harder to kind of like deal with the logic on the back end to like present things as a range in the first place. Uh, so I, I don't think anyone's trying to be like dishonest uh, or trying to mislead people. But I do think a lot of just online calculators that exist for all sorts of things do give people uh, sometimes like an excessive um, illusion of precision yeah. about the calculations they're doing. Where if something says like, dude, you're burning 437.6 calories. You're like, holy shit. Like if you got that decimal in there, man, it, it must be that or something extremely, extremely close to it. But no, I mean, in anything like this, um, it's a, it's an estimate. Like it's, it's an approximation at best. So any, any estimate there is like an inherent implied range of variability around that point estimate, uh, and, this calculator actually makes it explicit, which uh, I think is very nice. Yeah, I think, you know, like you said, there are other exercise energy expenditure calculators that exist, um, but but they basically have three three things that I would view as shortcomings, or maybe we're, we're just doing a different thing than what they're doing. But uh, like you said, they don't reflect the level of precision very well. Um, they, they, they just give you a single number. They don't really give you a range to help you understand, okay, I know this isn't exact, but what what's the realistic probable range we're talking about here? So that's one shortcoming. Another thing is that they they don't frame it relative to your predicted resting energy expenditure. And the reason that matters is because if you were not exercising, you would still exist. Um, so so the question is not how many calories did I burn during that session, but how many more did I burn? versus an alternate reality where I was just hanging out, sitting around, you know, so, so the added component is important there. Um, and then another element, like you said, is they don't take any effort to deal with the, the concept of energy compensation, which again, as we've talked about, it's not a hundred percent, but it's certainly not 0% in the vast majority of cases either. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, th th I think people listening might say, okay, that sounds good. It sounds like you've improved upon an idea that previously existed, but you might be wondering why this would actually be useful um, aside from just being interesting. So there's three use cases that come to mind for me. Uh, the first one, most straightforward based on some of the research we've talked about previously, this calculator makes it easier to incorporate exercise changes into a weight loss program or a weight gain program. But basically it helps you say, okay, I'm, I'm changing up my exercise how might I change up my nutrition in order to accommodate that while I'm pursuing some kind of weight-related goal, whether it's weight loss, weight gain, weight maintenance. Um, so, so this uh, helps you, make since it is focusing on the, the net impact on total daily energy expenditure, it's a much more tangible way to make those kinds of decisions about how you can adjust your diet to accommodate these exercise changes. Um, a second uh, potential use case Maybe you're just cruising toward whatever body composition goal that you have in mind, but there's some atypical exercise bout that pops up, right? So like maybe you're going to do uh, like a charity run or you're going to accompany a friend on like a pretty tough hike um, and you're like, okay, I, I want to account for that with, with my dietary intake. You know, I like the rate of weight change I'm experiencing and I just want to keep it going. So I want to make sure I'm... I'm accommodating this unexpected increase in expenditure. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, a one-off exercise bout like this is not going to derail your long-term efforts, whether you're trying to gain, lose, maintain weight. Uh, but some people simply want to, uh, some people just feel better about saying, okay, I, I feel like I'm taking some proactive step to kind of steady the ship here and keep my energy availability relatively constant rather than having this huge variation where, where this one day I'm in an unusually large deficit, right? So that, that's a very justifiable uh, use case for this. 
Another one would be, um, you know, maybe you're gearing up for an anticipated change in your exercise habits and you just want to be proactive about ensuring that you're actually fueling those efforts, you know, so maybe you're really kicking up your training a notch or, you know, maybe you're going to do like a charity run and you're going to start a training program for it. And you're like, I just want to make sure that I am fueling those workouts effectively and that as I ramp up my physical activity here, that I'm going to be you know, adequately fueled for workouts and adequately recovering from them as well. You want to make sure that you're not under eating relative to your change in exercise. And so, so this gives you a, a tool that helps you do that in a way that's really personalized. And, you know, these predictive equations, like I said, are going to be completely tailored to your situation, which is very different from just relying on some heuristic that says, oh yeah, running generally burns about this many calories or something mm -hmm. like that. So, um, what I'm going to do is on the screen on YouTube, if I can figure out the technology, I'm going to actually show an example here. Uh, so basically you can go into this tool uh, and it's going to ask you to select a type of exercise, right? And so for this example, I'm going to put in uh, cycling as the prompt here, and I'm going to scroll down and find uh, stationary bicycling. And I'm going to do that at 90 to 100 watts. So maybe I've got like one of those uh, you know, uh, stationary bikes that shows me my wattage on the screen as I'm pedaling and I'm planning to be 90, 100 watts. But of course, if you open up the tool and look at the, the, the different exercises available, there is a huge variety. It's not like everything is going to make you calculate a watt value. Some of it is very, very real world in terms of how it describes the exercise. Some of it is more quantitative, like this particular selection. Uh, so you're going to choose the exercise type and, and confirm it. Then you're going to type in the duration in minutes. So we're going to say 30 minutes of cycling in this 90 to 100 watt range. Uh, you're going to put in your body weight for this example. We'll say 70 kilograms. That's kind of the, the most generic body weight you'll ever find in the research. It's always a 70 kilogram person. Uh, body fat percentage, let's say 15%. But as you can see, hopefully on the screen, uh, the tool does provide some... Um, some visuals to kind of help you broadly assess where your body fat percentage might be. And this doesn't have to be exact. You just have to get within a, you know, w within hopefully a few percentage points either way. It doesn't have to be precise. Just want to get in the ballpark there. Clothes only counts for horseshoes, hand grenades, and also this, uh, this exercise energy expenditure calculator. Absolutely. A as the, as the popular saying goes. Absolutely. And then now uh, what we're going to do is uh, indicate whether we're gaining, losing, or maintaining weight currently, because like we said previously, uh, you know, current energy status can be a pretty important factor. So for this example, I'm going to say I'm maintaining weight, so I'm in neutral energy balance, relatively speaking. Um, it's going to ask how many training sessions I, I typically do per week. Um, and, and this isn't specific necessarily to this exercise bout. It's just your general training habits overall. Uh, so I'm going to say I train one to three training sessions per week on, throughout a typical week. And it's also going to ask me about my general activity level. So uh, for this example, let's say that I walk somewhere between 5,000 to 15,000 steps per day. That would put me in the moderate activity level category. So I'm going to select that. And if you don't know how many steps per day you take, that's totally fine. Those are just to kind of help people get kind of get a general vibe of how these categories work. Um, but but you basically can make your own assessment about, generally speaking, outside of the gym, outside of structured exercise, uh, your your non-exercise activity level day to day, are you typically pretty sedentary, pretty active, or, or kind of moderate or somewhere in the middle? So you're going to type in those things, pretty simple, pretty easy to use, and it's going to tell me that my added energy expenditure from exercise after accounting for compensation is 136 kilocalories, but the probable range is somewhere in the ballpark of 78 to 194 calories. So uh, this is how the tool works. Again, this is trying to assess the net impact on total daily energy expenditure, which can be very, very informative uh, for the variety of use cases that I mentioned. The last thing I want to mention, though, here is there is one use case that I would very strongly in no uncertain terms, discourage. Uh, there, there's one way that I really don't want to see people using this tool. I have no way to, of knowing <laughs> if anyone uses it for this, but I would really discourage people from using this tool for one specific thing. Uh, so Halloween is coming up. 
in the United States. Oh, yeah. Uh, it is a candy-driven holiday. And Thanksgiving is coming up as well, believe it or not. It, it kind of snuck up this year as it does all years. But um, within the next six, six weeks, we're going to have two very food-focused holidays uh, in the United States. And a lot of well-intentioned fitness enthusiasts and fitness professionals and influencers on the internet are going to talk a little bit about, yeah, they're going to post about how, oh, if you have two fun size Kit Kat bars, here's how many miles you have to walk to offset that. Or here's how many minutes of circuit training you have to do to burn off those calories. How many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Pop? I have no idea, but here's how many jumping jacks you would need to do to make up for it. Exactly. So so that is a genre of fitness content that is going to hit the internet pretty hard uh, over the next six weeks or so. Um, and people are going to start kind of reinforcing this idea of making these transactional deals where you're trading exercise in order to afford some kind of food, you know, whether it's, you know, mashed potatoes on Thanksgiving or a fun size Reese cup on, on, on Halloween. So people are going to be reinforcing this idea that you have to earn calories or that you have to trade exercise in order to justify eating calories. Uh, that is completely antithetical to everything that we believe uh, about eating and exercise. Uh, it, it reinforces some really problematic perspectives about food and exercise. It uh, is based on the literature uh, pertaining to the psychology that goes into eating behaviors. It's just bad news in every possible sense. Okay, so uh, we absolutely don't enforce that. Or we, we don't uh, support or reinforce that kind of perspective about the relationship between food and exercise. If you want a candy bar, eat a damn candy bar. You know, there, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. You don't have to justify it. You don't have to, you know, cross off some list and say, yeah, I did 146 jumping jacks or whatever calculation you find. Uh, we, we want to completely separate ourselves from that perspective. And I would really discourage using this particular tool to try to do any kind of transactional bargaining where you say, okay, I've decided that, you know, tonight I'm going to have this 300 calorie kind of hedonic deviation. So let me go and kind of mess around with this calorie calculator and see what I got to do to make up for that. I, mm -hmm. I just would strongly discourage people from doing that because that's no way to live. And based on the research, it, it's also no way to view food or exercise. Yeah, it, it's a uh, radical perspective, but it, it's fine to simply enjoy things. Right. I, I, I think that... Uh, I think that like the the Protestant, um, like the Puritan ethos has just like deeply infected the American mind, um, it, like to to an extent where like it applies to e even people who wouldn't consider themselves like particularly puritanical. Where there's this idea, I think some people have where if you if you enjoy something too much, like if something's too good, it it's got to be bad right, in some way. Yeah. Like it, it has to be perhaps sinful uh in like <laughs> yeah. the original conception and so you either need to have like guilt or shame attached to it or you need to like self-flagellate and do some sort of penance like in this case like x number of sit off sit-ups to like burn off that uh that hershey's bar or whatever um and like yeah you, like you just don't have to it's it's fine to just enjoy things have a good time um and especially since they're holidays i mean Halloween comes around once a year. Thanksgiving comes around once a year. Um, it is, it, it would be virtually impossible to do so much damage on those days that it uh, significantly derails you from whatever goals you're pursuing the other 363 days out of the year. So yeah, yeah, it's it's fine. Like just just have fun, enjoy yourself. Um, don't don't come to this calculator on November first. And try to figure out what, what you got to do to pay off the debt. Yeah, I mean, you know, mathematical estimates of the energy cost of storing a new kilogram of fat, you know, somewhere in the ballpark of 9,400 kilocalories. So, yeah, doing the calculus for the fun size Kit Kat bar is psychologically not ideal and physiologically irrelevant in the long run uh, for your body composition goals. Um, and one more thing. uh one of the one of the very fun things about macro factor that that I think is super cool 
is the Thanksgiving thing. <laughs> so oh, yeah. with, with AI describe within it, you can, you can kind of speak into the phone microphone and, and kind of report your food that way. And uh, you, you can basically just say like, is it Thanksgiving or is it Thanksgiving dinner? Um, it is Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah. So if you just say Thanksgiving dinner, it'll actually give you like a pretty representative meal for Thanksgiving dinner that you can log. So that way you can be like, okay, like I'm generally, you know, keeping my finger on the pulse here, but I'm having a low stress, enjoyable food centered holiday that doesn't have any, you know, any uh, guilt or shame associated with it. And you don't have to walk around and say, hey, grandma, um, can I uh, weigh the, the cranberry sauce when you're not using it? Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's a recipe that we that we get from the uh, Nutrition X library composed of uh, several of their common food entries. Six ounces of turkey, uh, a cup of mashed potatoes with gravy, half a cup of stuffing, half a cup of sweet potato casserole, half a cup of green bean casserole, quarter cup of cranberry sauce, a dinner roll, teaspoon of butter, and a slice of pumpkin pie. That's like what what goes into just like the general uh, uh, entry here for Thanksgiving dinner. It's like seven hundred or 1,760 calories, which I don't know. That that feel that feels about right. Yeah. Um, and yeah, if you eat a little more than that, a little less than that, if there's uh, some degree of tracking error, even like a reasonably significant degree of tracking error for just like one meal one day a year, like, nah, just... Just relax. It's fine. Like that's that's not going to throw anything off. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I think that's all I got for this episode. Do you have anything to to add, or are we good to go? Um, I have two things to add. One, uh, recording time right now, an hour and thirty six minutes. So we did it. Uh, we we kept it under two hours. I'm I'm proud of us. Unless so, po- unless point number two is going to take us thirty minutes. No, we'll it see won't. See what happens. It won't. Uh, I I just. I just, I just want to revel in this moment with you here right now. Um, actually came in close to 90 minutes pretty good. Uh, we don't have a a to play us out segment generally anymore, uh, but I'm I'm uh, making an executive decision to throw one in on this episode. Uh, if you either already have an Apple TV subscription or wouldn't have uh, an issue with getting one, which I think they have a free trial, and I think... If they don't, it's like five bucks a month. Like it, it's one of the cheaper streaming services. Um, there was a show called Bad Sisters that just had its finale uh, last night as of the time of recording. So um, more than last night by the time this episode actually comes out. Uh, anyway, it it was a wonderful show. Just absolutely delightful. Um, and just as a, a media recommendation, I, I would recommend checking it out. It was... It was a very fun romp. Uh, well, while we're doing to play us out stuff, I have a correction to make to my correction earlier. So I, I'm uh, doubly correcting here. Uh, when you were talking about the scandal with Fat Bear Week, um, you know, you had mentioned that Holly uh, w- had gotten some very sketchy votes that were eventually overturned and i said well i'm seeing on the internet here that it was actually bear 435 we were wrong i said 480 480 is otis i knew that rookie mistake it was 435 holly yeah 435 holly um but but i think i said well no it wasn't holly it was this number it 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 was 435 holly um but honestly i kind of like the idea that i that i just stripped the name holly from it because in a competition where only a handful of the bears actually have humanish names, uh, I think with this voter fraud, Holly should be stripped of her title, and I think she should go back to Bear Four Thirty Five. So it was an accident, but I actually stand by it, which I do with, uh, in fact, most of my accidents. I so yeah, she's back to Four Thirty Five. I think that should generalize. I think if anyone ever loses any vote or election, period, they they're just stripped of their name. Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, shame on 435 Holly, who is now simply bear number 435. Yep. All right, well, that does it with the, uh, for this episode. As always, thank you so much for listening, and we will be back soon with another. Thank you for listening to the Stronger by Science podcast. If you enjoyed the podcast, be sure to sign up for our free newsletter to get concise breakdowns of relevant research, as well as 28 free training programs for all skill levels and all schedules. We hate spam just as much as you do, so we'll only email you when we have something really interesting to share with you. 
You can sign up for the free newsletter at strongerbyscience.com slash newsletter, or just go to the Stronger by Science homepage and click the free programs button at the top. If you want to join in on the Stronger by Science podcast conversation, be sure to check out our Facebook group and our subreddit. The links for both are provided in the description of today's episode. Finally, please remember that we are not medical doctors or registered dietitians. So before you make any changes to your exercise or nutrition habits, be sure to check with a qualified healthcare professional. Once again, thank you for listening, and we will be back soon with another episode of the Stronger by Science podcast.